everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, as Molly said, I'm Liz Hutton alone. Uh, I work for Eric Klopfer's lab, the Scheller Teacher Education Program slash the Education Arcade. So on the Scheller side, uh, the lab offers a pathway of classes and also student teaching practicum for MIT students interested in pursuing um, a Massachusetts State uh, Licensing Certificate. And on the Education Arcade side, the lab explores playful learning. We have a lot of game-based projects. So that's just a little bit about our lab. So today I want to go ahead and talk about our approach to MOOC development, um, also and MOOCs in general. I want to share a little bit of data uh, regarding our forums, and I also want to take a closer look at one of our courses, 11.127x. I'll tell you more about what that is in just a few minutes. Um, and I also would like to discuss uh, groups as well. So groups are part of our forums. So, um, in 2014 and 2015, our lab ran the EdTechX, the Educational Technology Program X series. So if you look, you'll see um, the various different courses. We started with the course on the design and development of educational technology, um, and then we eventually ended with the course on implementation and evaluation. Uh, so the final course of the series finished up in September of 2015. And we're currently in the process of rebooting the first one. So this is um, 11.132x, the design and development of educational technology. So the target audience for these courses um, is people who have all sorts of interest in ed tech, so everyone from developers to teachers. Um, 133x, the implementation and evaluation course, was, uh, was particularly directed towards educators and teachers. So for our courses, rather than using lectures, we actually use interviews. Uh, so we interview various experts in the field. And um, our courses are very much influenced by the pedagogical approach, computer-supported collaborative learning. So we really care about our students collaborating and also learning together, pursuing lines of inquiry, um, that type of stuff. So these are the edX forums. Um, these uh, forums have several features. They do allow voting and favoriting, um, but it can be a bit challenging to see what's going on in the threads. So our courses actually don't use these forums. We use different forums. So these are our forums. These are the um, forums that we use for EdTechX. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, various features. We enable sort of better sorting. We do topic tags. It's easier to see kind of what content is fresher. Um, and these are built on a WordPress template, but they've got a lot of uh, back-end and front-end development by uh, my colleague Paul Medlock-Walton, as well as others. So now let's take a look at what happened in the forums over the courses. Uh, so I've actually presented data from all four courses, and I wanted to call your attention to the forum users section of this. So while you know, we had a certain amount of learners enroll in the courses, only a certain percentage actually logged into the forums. Um, and you'll see on this page, I also include some information about session duration and um, also the, the number of sessions as well. So one thing to point out is that for 126X, uh, the forums actually weren't required. So that's why uh, things look a little bit lower for that course. Okay. Um, let's see, and you'll also notice that 127X had the highest amount of forum users. Um, that's important, and that's one reason why I'm going to take a closer look at uh, 127X. So uh, something to be aware of for our courses and also the forums in general is that all of our feedback happens there. We don't have any problems that are auto-graded for our courses. Instead, we have assignments, and we provide guidance for participants to grade each other, um, and not grade each other, and they're not assigning letter grades, but provide feedback, essentially. So let's go ahead and uh, take a closer look at 127X. So just a reminder what 127X, uh, what 127X is, um, this is the design and development of games for learning course, and this is the course that had the highest number of form users. Um, also, this course had six units, so it made it really easy for us to kind of look at checkpoints at unit one, unit three, and unit six. So in this course, learners explored the process of designing and developing educational games, including issues associated with assessment, implementation, and marketing. And for their project, they actually created a learning game. So some people created a digital learning game, while others created a more paper-based game. So this was our first time really taking a look at the forums and trying to kind of categorize the, peer, the types of peer responses we saw. 
So we looked at the forms um, holistically, and when I say the forms, I'm saying we really spent the most time on the assignment forms where students were submitting work for feedback. And we noticed that there were three main types of responses. So prompt-driven responses. So the participant has made it really clear you know, that they are responding to the prompt that we gave, up, we gave them. You know, they want to do what we told them to do. Um, to helpful, constructive uh, type of responses. So for these participants, you know, maybe they didn't use the prompt that we gave them, but um, they uh, you know, did really want to help the participant improve their work and provided some helpful feedback. And finally, we also noticed comment thought responses. So uh, the participant you know, would generally be positive or negative about the other participant's work, but they wouldn't go much thir uh, further. Sometimes they would give a story or provide some sort of reflection or um, anecdote. So there is a lot of work to be done regarding more descriptive categories, um, and especially for the comments section. Um, and it's also important to note that these aren't the only types of posts that we saw in our forums. There were also other types of, of posts as well, but for the purposes of this project, we focused on the assignment forums. So I'll talk a little bit about methodology for this project. So we, we selected three assignments from 11127X, um, one in Unit 1, one in Unit 3, and one in Unit 6. Unit 6, and we only considered topics and posts submitted before the end of the course. Let me explain the topic versus post distinction. So when a participant posts their work on an assignment, that's a topic, but you may have several um, other participants respond. So there's both a topic and then responses of posts in that as well. So we wanted to take a sampling, so we basically used the qu equivalent of a coin flip to decide if a post was included in the project. And then we considered each post that was included as part of the sampling in terms of the types of peer responses that I've just explained to you, and then we coded accordingly. So let me tell you a little bit more about the assignments that we looked at for this. Uh, for, the, for unit one, the assignment we took a look at was uh, the participants were told to pick a game and try to evaluate whether or not they thought it was a useful learning tool. Then for unit three, they were asked to create a prototype for their game with documentation about several items. Then for unit six, um, the assignment was basically finish up your project and reflect on the process. So we um, you know, had a very small team, very small team of coders for this project, um, and it would be helpful to have more people kind of looking, looking at this, looking at these posts overall. So let me show you what an assignment prompt looks like. So um, for this assignment prompt, I've just excerpted the uh, peer feedback guidelines. So as you see, we are providing them instructions and we're telling them what to do and how to do it, but we're not saying, you know, use this exact rubric. It's, it's more open-ended than that. Just give you a second to take a look at that. Okay. Great. So now you're probably wondering, um, what, are, what are these posts actually like in real life? And I'm actually going to uh, help show you what these categories look like by showing you some sample posts from the 127X forums. So these are real posts um, from our forums, but uh, we have made some edits for readability and also to protect the names of the innocent um, as well, and perhaps the guilty, I'm not sure. So this is an example of a prompt-driven post. Um, as you'll see, because uh, you saw the prompt just a, minute, uh, just a, a second ago, uh, the participant used kind of language that we used in the prompt, and they, they addressed it based on the guidelines that we gave them. So it wasn't always as clear and easy to tell if the post that we were looking at was prompt driven. Uh, this person did a great job of letting us know, hey, I followed the prompt, but some of them just weren't as clear. So the next one I'd like to take a look at is helpful constructive. So in this post, um, now this is from a different assignment. I did sort of pull posts from throughout the forums. Um, this participant is clearly trying to help the other participant improve their game, but this particular post is not really tied to any prompt that we gave them. So, and for helpful constructive um, posts, there were definitely different kinds. Um, we had participants, you know, focus more on learning objectives or classroom applications, um, technical issues and mechanics. Um, these posts could vary depending on the background of the participant commenting, for example. Finally, this is an example of a comment and thought. Now, I don't want uh, you to come away with the idea that comments and thoughts are negative. Some of these you know, were very heartfelt reflections, um, but they weren't always as useful for a participant who's really trying to improve their project. 
So I wanted to take a look at peer responses uh, across the three assignments and call your attention to a few things. Um, so we thought that in unit one, since participants were just starting out, that we would see a lot more of these comment thought type responses. And that did turn out to be the case of the ones included in this little project. Um, the other thing that we thought is we thought we'd also find a lot more miscategorized posts. You know, maybe that participants had just posted randomly in assignment forums. Um, and to be honest, that really wasn't the case. Most of the posts, most of the topics and posts that we saw in the assignment forum were tied to the particular assignment. Um, you will notice, um, looking at the slide overall, that the number of prompt-driven responses is actually pretty low. Uh, so there's a couple of reasons why we think that's the case is one, our prompts are pretty open-ended. Um, if we used a more rubric-driven approach, I, I think that we would perhaps see a higher rate of prompt-driven responses. And we also didn't require that participants formally structure their responses in terms of the prompts. You know, we say consider this as you respond. So I'd like to talk about another area of our forums now, which are groups. Um, as part of our WordPress-driven forums, we also give participants the opportunity to collaborate with other participants and groups. And this functionality was first implemented in 127X, and then we also used it in our next course in the series, 133X, that's the implementation evaluation course. So participants have the opportunity to participate in two types of groups. Um, the first one is affinity group, affinity group. So any participant can create an affinity group. It could be, um, you know, about homeschooling, or perhaps teachers in Sao Paulo. Those are examples of titles. Um, and then for the survey-based group, they basically fill out a survey that asks them questions about availability and also ability in certain areas. And they are randomly put into a group. And I just wanted to uh, ask the audience quick. So I've given you two ki uh, kinds of groups. Which type of group do you think was more popular with participants? Um, who says affinity groups? Raise your hands. Okay. What about survey-based working groups? Interesting. Okay. So um, I would like to report, I'm going to move on to the next slide here, that unfortunately our survey-based working groups were, were overall uh, not as popular um, and also not as su successful. You know, I wish I could say these groups that were created by these surveys, they had very productive working relationships, but that hasn't been the case as we've observed. Um, these groups sometimes would start out with a few intro, intro posts here and there, like, hello, my name is so-and-so, I'm a math teacher in Wisconsin, that sort of thing. But these groups didn't tend to continue for longer than really these introductions. While we had some affinity groups that were much more productive, where participants shared coursework together, they shared interests, they shared resources, that sort of stuff. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about some of our uh, more popular affinity groups. So for 127X, um, the games development in higher education had the most members. But our math games group in that course had the most posts. That was a very active group. So um, yeah, and, and these affinity groups really did generate some interesting connections and also some on-site meetups as well. Um, so on our current course, which is the reboot of 132X, we are still running these groups, but we're trying to encourage uh, the use of them more effectively. So I've got several community TAs that I'm working with, and they've both adopted, they've all uh, adopted affinity groups in several cases to try to see if we can encourage more group activity. Let's see. So I just wanted to end this talk by uh, thanking Professor Klopfer and also two of our team members who have worked a lot on our course forums, which are so um, important and essential for our course's success. Uh, it's Paul Medlock walton and also Orit Gaguzinski as well. So thank you very much. Tell me you wanted me to use a mic. Um, so it sounded like your prompt-driven uh, responses mm -hmm. uh, was a categori categorization for like the first um, post in a thread, whereas so, the other ones sounded like responses to a thread. I apologize. Perhaps I didn't explain it as well as I could have. So um, the 
prompt-driven responses were still in response to a topic. So basically, our participant would say, all right, here's my response to assignment 1.1, and then we'd have participants give that participant feedback. And sometimes those participants given a way, gave feedback in a way that was prompt-driven, and other times they responded in different ways. Does that help clear it up? Yeah, that makes more sense. Great. So in those statistics that you were showing, you, mm -hmm. you, you didn't count any of the here is my first initial post on what I've done. No. You were um, just looking at the responses to Well, the... we did only in the fact that, like, if that, if the initial post was counted, that we considered the response below it. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't counted, it wasn't categorized as any of those three things because it wasn't a response, per se. I mean, it was a response to the assignment, but not a pure response. So does this mean that there was some, um, uh, some people who posted to say, here's what I've done, and they got crickets? <laughs> Actually, um, it's a good question. Um, we did find that most people did receive some peer, uh, some peer response. It wasn't always of the best quality. <laughs> I can't say, you know, everyone got one great quality response, but most participants did receive a response from a peer. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Sure. It sounds like what you're looking for really is to get a lot of peer learning because there were so many uh, responses and postings that you could sort of sift through them yourself. Is that true? And, and what's the quality of the peer learning between the uh, participants? So say? let me make sure I understand the question because um, when you say the quality of peer learning, what, what, ex what like, do you mean, I'm a, are you looking at learning and participants as a whole? I'm sorry, I'm a little confused about what you're asking. Well, I'm probably confused myself. No, <laughs> that's okay. Um, do you, did you notice that comments or, or um, uh, anything that was any input was actually helpful, seemed visibly helpful to the people in the class among each other? Yes, um, I would say that there were a lot of helpful constructive responses. Um, uh, it, yes, I mean, there's, there's, at least from what I've observed, there's a real impetus between the participants to help each other. So they understand that this is the only way people get feedback. You know, there's no auto grading. Like, you're not going to hear about your work from one of the core staff members. This is your shot to get feedback. That makes sense. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the um, affinity groups were better. Something we're trying to chill for, because we, we read some some research about sort of group dynamics, mm -hmm. and at the beginning of the semester we had like 600 students, and we were trying to match them based on you know like seven parameters sort of thing. And, um, one year we just told them to reorganize themselves, and it worked way much better okay. uh, according to what the faculty thought. And I, and I also was talking to some people. Um, they were trying to do an online teacher training program. And, and um, one thing that they noticed is that the online interaction was not that great until they actually met in person. And, and somehow, like once they sort of, I, I guess that you have to go through a team building process. And once you get over that, it becomes much easier to do the online interaction. Like, I don't know if you feel that that's part of it. I mean, the, the matching process has to be a little bit more personal, which is something that's much easier to do in person rather than to sort of crunch some numbers or get some data to it. Yeah, um, you know, I wish we had the opportunity, and you know, this is a MOOC, so we've got participants from all over the place, to have more in-person meetings. I think you're right that we would be um, more successful. Though I should mention that there have been in-person meetings that have spawned based on affinity group activity. That has happened a few times. I, you know, I don't know how many times, but more than once. <laughs> so. Um, but uh, I, I think you're right, is that the fact that people are joining these groups because they're like, you know, you know wow, I, I have this interest too, I want to share with my fellow participants, that's, that's an important impulse. Thank you. Maybe we should move on. Great. Go to our next speaker, but thank you so much, I really appreciate that. Thank you.